Welcome to the International School of Tailoring. My name is Reza and this is going to be your 26th lesson of our How to Make a Bespoke Jacket series. Congratulations! You've prepared all the panels of your jacket and hopefully you've learned a lot. We're about to put all the panels of our jacket together and turn it into a 3D object. We're going to work on shoulders, side seams, colors and all of that. But before we get to that, in this lesson I want to focus on the remaining two subsets of relative length. Gather and shape by angle. So this is what we're going to do. First I'm going to teach you the techniques along with a few examples. Then I'm going to show you where they are used. And last but not least, I'll leave you with a few exercises. Let's begin. Both of these techniques are a subset of relative length. Although they are very similar, they are not the same. The reason why they happen and they exist is not the same. Most tailoring workshops will refer to both of these techniques as either ease or fullness. So they would say, put more ease in the fabric or the garment needs more fullness in that given area. That is very confusing if you're using one name for two techniques that have a very different foundation. On the other hand, if you look into the broader sewing literature, fullness is everything that manipulates the fabric into a shape. So darts, pins, tucks, what, anything. That also is not very helpful. So we are really isolating each one of these techniques so that we can refer to specifics of those techniques. Let's see what they are. A gather is whenever we take a piece of material, like so, and we intentionally and manually draw a part of that material together. That could be right on the edge, that could be right in the center, it could be straight, it could be curved, diagonal, whatever. Some techniques create a gather as a byproduct of that technique. I am not referring to that gather because that gather happens automatically and your focus is not on the gather, your focus is on that technique. But when I say gather, I'm referring to the gather that we specifically and intentionally put in a given area of our fabric and we can do that in multiple ways. So let's see how that looks. The first type of gather is a gather that happens right on the edge of our material. We can achieve this by using a hand stitch or a machine stitch. Whenever we gather the edge of our material, we are creating a surface with a positive curve. Think of the cup or the dome. We can also gather the middle part, the center of our surface. Whenever we do that, that creates a surface with a negative curve. Think of the saddle. You can see if I bend this over, we have a concave surface and a convex surface at the same time. Both of these effects can be achieved with a machine stitch. Here we have two rows of machine stitches and they are done on a longer stitch length and a looser top thread tension. And whenever we pull the two top threads, we are easing in our material. We can then choose to either pleat them or to compress them with the iron or to simply leave them as they are. Then we have another type. We can also create a gather by pulling one material over the other. Here, for example, I've used the tape and I've pulled that tape over my fabric to gather the fabric underneath it. I've secured this tape with a padding stitch or a running stitch and with every stitch I've done a back tack to make sure that the gather is locked in place. The purpose of doing this is to make the gather permanent. If I would now compress this with the iron, I wouldn't be able to stretch out my material because the tape is preventing me from doing that. This is a great way to lock something in place without having to worry about it anymore. Now, another way of doing a gather is to manually push the top layer of two layers between each stitch that we do. This will allow us to ease in fabric or put fullness into the top layer or simply said, gather the top layer and secure it on the layer underneath. Whenever we do this, and that happens on the edge of our material, we are creating again a surface with a positive curve. If we would do this right in the middle, we would create a surface with a negative curve. That is what a gather is and all the variations of it. Let's see where gathers are used. 
Here we have a few panels of a jacket, pretty much all the panels of the jacket, and these green lines indicate a gather. Not every jacket needs all these gathers and neither are they all essential, but here are just some examples. The first one being the most commonly used on the back shoulder. People put that gather there so that the back shoulder can supposedly go over the shoulder muscles right here and accommodate to some extent for the blades. I tend to disagree with it, but it's so popular that I've just put it there. Then we have the back side, side body side and the front side, which will make up a large part of the armhole. And we gather that area because it's largely on the bias and we want the armhole to always be closely gripping the wearer's arm. Sometimes the upper part of the side seam on the back is gathered to create a fullness right here below the blades on the back in case the wearer needs that. The middle part of the undercolor brake line is sometimes gathered to create a close gripping effect on the back neck. Then we have the brake line of the jacket, which is sometimes gathered and permanently secured with a tape over it, which we call a bridle. The front edge curve is gathered to create a cupping effect inwards along with the rest of the front edge. And of course, our sleeve will benefit from a gather. However, sleeves do not create their shape just by a gather. They are also largely created by shape by angle, which we're going to cover in a second. But this should give you an idea of where a gather is used on a jacket. Now, let's do a few exercises. The first exercise is to create a gather right on the edge of your fabric. Take any fabric, double your basting thread with a knot right at the end, and then insert your needle in, bring it out, and then go back in where you started, and then come out in front of your thread. This could be a quarter of an inch, six millimeters, and then wrap your thread from below or above the needle and create a loop. And slightly pull. Now, if you did it from above, keep that all the way to the end. If you did it from below, keep that all the way to the end. And so again, you're going to insert your needle right where your thread is coming out here in front. Make a bite of one centimeter or three eighths. Wrap around the needle and then gently pull like so. And then go all the way to the end. Simply fasten off, cut your thread and then observe. Have a look and see exactly what you've done. Different fabrics will give you different results. Once you've looked around, then try to compress it with the iron. Whenever you are compressing it, stay in the area of the gather. If you push the iron all the way, you will flatten the surface. This exercise is gonna help you to understand how much you can actually gather or draw in with different fabrics. It also helps you to understand how much you should pull and the feel of it all. Then I want you to do exactly the same thing right in the middle of the surface and create a concave curve on your surface like this. Again, have a look, observe, different fabrics react differently. Once you've done this, try to compress it. See how the compression of a gather in the middle of your panel looks like. Gently go with the iron over the gather and then lift the other side up and do exactly the same. Now, the goal here is not to try to make a perfect gather. The goal is to take it to the extremes. Try to get so much fabric in until it pleats. That way you can really test the limits of a fabric that you are trying out. I want you to take a piece of fabric and a ribbon. If you don't have a ribbon, just cut the same fabric as a narrow strip. Then place that ribbon or that tape on your fabric right in the middle. Take your thread with a knot at the end and take a bite. Fasten on. And once you've done that, I want you to pull the ribbon or the tape tight. And by doing that, you're pushing a little bit fabric towards your starting points. Take a bite and do a back tack. Repeat. Once you've done this, try another stitch. Instead of doing a running stitch and a back tack, 
try a padding stitch. Pull, bite, back tack. Pull, bite, back tack. Hold it in a different way. Pull, bite, back tack. All of this will build muscle memory in your fingers so that whenever you're actually doing this on the real jacket, you feel prepared. The last gather exercise is the following. Take two rectangles, like so, with a straight edge. Then take your basting thread, make a knot, take a bite, fasten on, and then I want you to push some fabric towards your starting point, then go over that surplus and take a bite. Repeat, push the fabric in, take a bite, and go all the way to the end. Once you've done that, fasten off, cut your thread, observe, see exactly what you've done. Try to push these around, play with it, have fun. Once you've looked, try to compress it. See if you can. If there is too much, it will pleat. Push it to the extreme and test it out. See how much you can actually get in there. Do this with different fabrics and before you know it, you will have a feel for how much any fabric can have. Now, let's have a look at shape by angle. Whenever we have two panels, and those two panels don't have the same shape on the edge, but one of them is forced around the other, volume is created. The bigger the difference between the edge shapes, the more volume. The less difference, less volume. When I say they don't have the same shape on the edge, I mean that whenever you put them next to one another, they don't fit together like a puzzle. Now, how can you tell what the difference is between the shape of these edges? What you have to do is the following. You have to match the two patterns on the starting and ending point of the sewing lines. And so whenever we would do that, we would end up with something like this. And whenever you do that, what you'll notice is that there is either an overlap or there is a gap. If you really want to get technical about this, the size of this gap you will measure by measuring the angle of that gap. But we're not going to do that for our practical purposes. We're just going to refer to it as big difference, little difference, small difference, whatever. So on a positive curve, you would get an overlap. On a negative curve, for example, if we don't have a circle but a half moon and we put our rectangle right there, matching the starting and ending points of our sewing line, we would have a gap again. This gap is what is causing the volume whenever this is secured around. So if we would have our circle and our square would be forced around the circle, we would create a positive surface curve on this rectangle. If we would have a half moon with a concave line, a negative uh, curve, and we would secure our rectangle around it, we would end up with something like this, which would give us a negative surface curve. Let's see how this looks on fabric. Here we have a panel with a convex line right on the edge. If we take our straight rectangle and we attach the edge of the rectangle around this bend, we will create a positive curve on our rectangle. Let's see how this looks. As you can see, we have created a positive curve on the surface of our rectangle. You will see these surpluses and think that this is very similar to a gather, and that is true. If anyone would tell you that you have put too much fullness into this rectangular edge, you can always think about whether that too much fullness is created by you putting in a lot of fullness or because of the big difference between the edge shape that these two have. That is very important to keep in mind. Here we have a 
panel with a negative curve, a concave line. And again, if we take our rectangle and we secure the edge of this rectangle around this concave line, we will create a negative surface curve on our rectangle. As you can see, this resembles a wedge that we introduce on our panel or a stretching out that we have done on this edge. If I would bend this, you can see that it looks like a saddle. It is concave and convex at the same time. Now, keep in mind that the volume is created on that panel that is forced around the other one. So as long as this panel here with the concave edge remains fixed and flat, then it won't have any shape. But if we would join these two and then suddenly flatten this one, then that shape is transferred onto the other panel. So keep that in mind. Now let's look at the areas where this technique is applied to. One of the examples is going to be our sleeves. Here we have our armhole and our top and under sleeve drawn in white lines. Now if we would take our under sleeve for example and we would match the starting and the ending point and align that on the area on the armhole, that would create the under sleeve position as indicated with the yellow lines. And as you can see, there is going to be an overlap between the edge of the undersleeve and the edge of the armhole. That gap will create volume right on the undersleeve there. The bigger that gap is, the more volume you're going to have in your undersleeve and the smaller the gap, the less. Also note that the ending point of our undersleeve is a lot higher than where the ending point is on the armhole. That is because we can also make this line longer so that we push in extra length by manual gather and manually gather extra fabric there to create more volume if we don't want to increase this gap right here. Same thing goes for our top sleeve and this is really one of the areas that benefits from it. The other example where this technique is used is on the undercolor. Let me show you how. Whenever we want to sew our undercolor, we place our jacket like this on our ham and as you can see we have our break lines right here and those break lines should match the break line of our undercolor crease. However, you will notice these two shapes that we have on the shoulder sticking upwards. If we would just place our undercolor right on top and begin sewing, the undercolor itself is flat on the surface and will not match the shape that we have here. So what we do is we look at the angle right here and increase that angle on our undercolor so that whenever we lay our undercolor on top, you can see the break line is moving away from the break line of the jacket. However, whenever we sew the undercolor, we force this back and that creates this surplus right on the fall of the undercolor which then falls nicely into the shape that we have on the shoulders. That allows the shoulders and the undercolor to have the same shape when they are on the person's body. Word of caution, opposing shapes or opposing curves don't always result in volume. Let me tell you why and when that is the case. Sometimes we have a curved seam. To sew our curved seam, we would have to take our two panels, which are going to be like this, flip them right side to right side, and when we do that, we would end up with two opposing curves against one another. So naturally, you may think that whenever you're putting these two edges together, that you are creating shape by angle. However, these two edges are not going to remain as opposing curves. They are going to be folded over and once the seams are pressed, we would end up with a flat surface and a curved seam running through it. However, sometimes we have two panels that truly will end as opposing curves. Whenever we flip them over and place them right side to right side to create our seam, we may think that we're not putting any shape at all in any of these panels. So we go ahead and sew our seam and by the time we flip them over we will notice that we have created a negative curve on our surface or a positive curve. Just keep that in mind. Let's move on to the exercises for shape by angle.
I want you to take a piece of fabric and cut a shape like this. It's a rectangle with a curved edge. Then I want you to make three versions of it. One with a very subtle curve, one with a medium curve, and one with a very extreme curve. I also want you to cut three rectangles. Then I want you to place the rectangles on top of the curves, like so, with an overlap of one centimeter or three eighths. Then I want you to baste, and as you are basting, force this rectangle around the curves and completely secure it all the way. Do that on all three versions and look at the differences between the volumes that you have created on the surface of the rectangle. Then I want you to do exactly the same with a piece that has a negative curve, a concave line. Have a look and see exactly what the differences are and how severe the volume changes whenever you are changing the severity of the curve. That's all. Let's summarize. A gather is whenever we are manually drawing fabric together on a single or multiple layers. Shape by angle, on the other hand, is whenever we are joining panels that have different shapes along the edges. That results in volume. Please do the exercises that I've given you and don't take them for granted because it's those exercises that will prepare you for the difficult parts of our jacket. I can't wait to see the entire world benefit from our content. This is a large project and it requires a lot of time and resources. If you want to see our videos expand and you have benefited from them, help us with a small donation. You can do that by visiting the donations page of our website by simply clicking on that link in the description of this video. My name is Reza. This was today's lesson. Next one is going to be on shoulder theory, so make sure you're there. And until then, practice, practice, practice. Thank you.